So just to continue from where we left off before the prayer, may Allah accept from us all. So we were talking about how it is that if God is, <coughs> Allah is the creator of all actions, that the human can be morally responsible for them. So if we just come back to this last point, okay, we said that God brings the action to existence, if he wills, at the sight and time of the human's intention through, you know, executing through his power and having a will, not by the human's power. In other words, what brings it into existence isn't the human being, but, but it's God. To put this in another phrasing, this coinciding of the human's power and will, and I'm going to speak about in a moment why they're in, in these quotation marks, with God's bringing the action into existence is what we call acquisition, i.e. the human acquisition of that action. Right? And it's this acquisition that entails the moral attribution of the action to the human and thus his or her moral responsibility for it. Okay? So as we said, you intend to do something, be it good or bad, God creates that action, brings it into being, i.e. it happens. At that moment now, we can morally attribute that action to the person. Not its existentiation, not its happening, but the moral responsibility for it. Okay, clear? Now, why do I have power and will in scare quotes? Because as we talked about just before the break, we said that true power and true will, just like true knowledge, just like all the other attributes of God, that in the fullest meaning of these are only gods. Okay, so when we speak about, like we said a minute ago, our sight or our hearing, yes, we have sight and we have hearing, but they're not absolute like gods are. And likewise, power and will here, when speaking of human in relation to God, because we have to keep in mind, what does it mean for us to have power? The absolute power of God doesn't require, as we talked about earlier, when we talked about his, his omnipotence, his qudra, right? what did we say? We said God's power doesn't rely upon instruments. Right? If I want to drive somewhere, I need a car, I need an instrument, I need a bicycle, I need something, otherwise I can't drive anywhere, I can't, I can't do what I want to do. Okay, I want to cook something, I need instruments. I need, whatever it is, I need something by which to do the thing. That's, we're humans, we're, we're needy, we're dependent upon other things. A baby is dependent upon the mother for its survival. We're all dependent in one fashion or another on other created things. Right? Take the oxygen out of this room, we don't last very long. We're dependent upon oxygen. God is not dependent upon anything at all. God self, as we've talked about again previously, his baqa means he is self-subsisting. He has no need for anything. Everything is in need of him. His being is absolute. Our beings are restricted. By means of that restriction, that delimitation, we need other things. I need water every few minutes to keep going. Okay? God doesn't. His life is not like my life. My life depends on oxygen, water, etc. God's life does not. So what are we saying? The nature of our life is different than the nature of God's life. The nature of our power, okay, what is our power? It's a capacity that we have to use instruments and to bring about causes, you know, to use things that are causes and to have these things at our disposal. Right? Like what? Like my arm to be able to reach for something. To seize, I need an arm. When God seizes, there's no arm involved. Okay, i.e. when God takes it, he says it seizes the souls of people who have passed. There's no arm. He doesn't reach with an arm and catch their souls. And they can run away from the arm or something. Okay? Likewise, the will. What is God's will? God's will is absolute, as we talked about. It's connected to everything. If you remember last week's lesson, everything that is metaphysically possible. As we say, we're not talking about things that are metaphysically impossible. Okay, meaning definitionally impossible. Okay, so what is a human's will? A human's will is a choice to pursue a line of action. That's our will. 
Okay, I willed to come here today. I had to get on a bus, I had to travel, it might have happened, it might have happened, alhamdulillah it happened, here I am. But that was my choice to pursue a line of action. Instead of, whatever, walking to my bedroom and taking a nap, I instead walked down to the train station, to the bus station. That's my will. God's will is not, as we said, the nature of everything that we can say God has and I have, the nature is completely different. His is absolute. Okay, so this is why I have them in scare quotes. Because our power and our will simply means our capacity to use what's at our disposal and our choice to pursue a line that is given to us, that is available to us. God doesn't have these qualifications. So the true doer, the true existentiator is God. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Qur'an? You, you did not throw when you throw, threw, but Allah threw. Okay, speaking to you know, the Muslims around the Prophet at the time in their battles, don't attribute the fact that you struck someone to yourself. You attribute it to God. You did not throw negates. When you threw, confirmed. So how do you have that? And how, how in the same sentence are you negating and confirmed? It's at which level? At the phenomenal level, yeah, I saw whatever it is, uh, Sayyidina Hamza, Allah be pleased with him, I saw him throw a spear. or a But the true doer, the true per who brought that into existence, what is God saying in that? But God is the one who threw. He's the true doer of the thing. Okay, why? For all the reasons we've been talking about. Okay, and it's this acquisition, okay, this coinciding, of the human's power and will, coinciding with God's bringing into existence, this is what we call now acquisition, and it's this acquisition that entails the moral attribution of the action to the human. So that you can say now, Hamza killed so and so. Zainab fed a poor person. Okay? Now, because of that occurrence and coinciding, now we can say yes. They did this good thing or this bad thing. Okay? And thus they're morally responsible for it. So do you see what this does? This means two things. It answers these fundamental questions. Is a human completely coerced because all power is from God? The answer is no. There's no coercion. We are morally responsible. We know this intuitively. Everybody here knows that I can either do something good or I could do something bad or I could... Okay, this is something that, but when people think through everything we've been talking about now from a creedal perspective and a theological perspective helps answer this question. Is the human this completely coerced? No, there's things that we are, we have no choice in. That the, by force of will or no will of ours it happens. As we talked about, you're driving down the road and a car comes flying down and you end up harming someone because you, your car goes into them, so to speak. But still, that's not, I had no choice in this. In a sense, I was coerced into this, yes? Your, whatever, the, vas the circulation of your blood. How many of us sit here and think, okay, now circulate? Uh, we wouldn't last very long if we had to do that and still do everything else we had to do. There's many aspects to our existence right now that we're not even conscious about. There's no will involved. Okay, clear? As we said, sitting in this room requires a certain type of, of, of air pressure. They try to get these things fine-tuned right for air flights and things, otherwise people will, will die. Too little, too much, it's both, both are bad. So yes, we are coerced. We had no choice when to come into this planet, onto this planet, when we were born, etc. My will didn't have anything to do with that. But are we completely coerced? In the sense that we have no will, we have no choice, we have no responsibility? No, as we've talked about. The existentiation of things and their actions are both from God. Okay? But by that meilan, by that inclination, what we call a will, okay, this is where we take moral responsibility, as we just said here on this previous slide. Okay? Now, does the human being have complete freedom to bring his actions into being? By now the answer should be clear. No. There's so many dependencies that we as limited created beings have, just at that level. And B, as we said, on the ontological level, which is to say on the level of being 
to, to the being of God. It's the being of God that's absolute, his power that's absolute, his will that's absolute, not ours. So we're completely dependent upon him. We're completely and utterly dependent upon him. Okay? This is why we said, as we said at the beginning of the class, we are slaves, the servants of God. Why? Because we are dependent upon him utterly and completely. So does the human being have freedom? Yes. Freedom to choose. Freedom to intend. Freedom to make that inclination. But it's not absolute. It's not complete. It is delimited, it is restrictive, and ultimately it's, de it's dependent totally and utterly upon God Most High. Okay? Clear? This saves us from two extremes. There have been theological sects as well as philosophical schools, you know, both in Islam and in other religions and in other human societies, who came to believe that human beings are like puppets. They have absolutely no power whatsoever, no responsibility at all. Okay? Even amongst religious communities, including amongst some, some uh, there's a Muslim splinter group early on as well, about two centuries after the Prophet, who came to hold this position. And thus they interpreted paradise and hell away figuratively. Because what, what's the point of paradise and hell if you're not morally responsible for things? Okay. And at the other extreme, there have been people who said, no, human beings create their own actions. They're, they completely and utterly, how else would you attribute moral... We've, ad we've addressed these things. Do you see what I'm trying to do here? What we're trying to do is understand that if we understand this previous point, these previous points about our actions and our acquiring the moral responsibility for them, it solves these questions. It answers them in a way that is completely and utterly consistent with Revelation, where some parts of Revelation indicate that we are completely dependent upon our God, including our actions are created by Him, and also other parts of Revelation that are very clear that you're, real, you're morally liable, responsible. How do we square it? The way that we've talked about here. That the power is ultimately God's, truly in, in, in reality. Just like my ability to lift my hand right as I just did right now, Yes, I had an inclination, I had a will to do so, I had an intention to do so, but it's by God's power that I'm able to do so. Not by some intrinsic, this is the key point, not by an intrinsic power I have in myself, no. By a power that God creates, that, that, that brings the, His power that brings it into fruition. Okay? Clear? And this is why we attribute these actions, bad actions, for example, or to the human and not to the divine, morally speaking. And this is the meaning, as everyone's familiar, of course, with this hadith of the Prophet, the statement of the Prophet, <inaudible> Verily, actions are by intentions, and every person has what he or she intended. So again, the hadith here was in a different context, of course, as everyone's familiar. This is in the context of the immigration of the Muslims from Mecca to Medina, where some Muslims came in order to obey the messenger and, and live and learn with him. And others came because they had a good business deal in Medina, or maybe there was a, a beautiful woman they wanted to marry there. And so what did the Prophet continue to say? He whose immigration was for God and his messenger, his immigration is for God and his messenger. And he whose immigration is for some business to strike or some woman to marry, his immigration is for what he immigrated for. If that's what you want, then you don't get the higher. You go for the higher, you get everything that's below it as well. But the fundamental point is the beginning of this hadith in relation to what we're talking about. Actions are by intentions, not by you and your intrinsic power. You couldn't create yourself. How are you going to create your actions? How are you going to existentiate them, bring them into being? You're not. God is. Which is why, on a slightly more spiritual um, consequence of this, when we see good actions manifest that we're involved in, i.e. when we do good things, to say it in a more everyday language, what do we do? Do we go, yes, I'm amazing. I'm really the most pious person in my part of the world, in my corner of the room. I'm something amazing. I'm no, we say Alhamdulillah. We say praise be to God. We're grateful to God that these good things, morally right things, things that He loves to see, happened 
on our limbs, so to speak. Okay? So it leads to what? It leads to an attitude not of haughtiness, not of pride, not of holier than thou, but of gratitude and humility. Why? Because all we had was our intentions. The fact that God manifested these good things on our limbs is a cause of our gratitude. And this keeps one humble. Okay? The actions are ultimately God's. Okay? Now, having said all of that, there are some people, again, like I said, uh, some of these earlier uh, sects, um, and people from other, perhaps, philosophical outlooks who say, well, isn't this uh, oppression? So they, they raise an objection, in other words. They say, if everything you're saying is the case, if, you know, in other words, if actions, if, I'm sorry, if creatures and their actions are both created by God, you know, human beings, for example, or, and their actions, then would God's punishment of the disobedient not be oppression? Okay. Do you see what, where, what the question is, the objection? So the objection is, if God creates the people and their actions, on what basis then can he hold the disobedient, those who do you know, immoral, unethical things, hold them responsible? Okay. So by now, hopefully, we should be able to answer this in part. Which is what? Anyone? The will. Your intention is what you're liable for, not the actual action itself, so to speak. Okay? Now, meaning, it, of course, the will and the action have to coincide, and you have to thus be morally responsible for it, as we said. Kesim. Okay? But the actual power for it to have been brought into effect, no. This is, we continue to con affirm that this is God's. But this doesn't negate, as we said, the moral responsibility in the slightest. Okay? And to begin with, if we might even just take a further step back, the very question some is, is actually, again, theologically, philosophically wrong. Why? Because what is the definition of oppression? Okay? It's to dispose of something that is not yours in a way that the person who, whose it is doesn't want it to be. So I come into your house and I trash the house and I drink your, everything you've got and I eat all your food and you, had no, you don't want me to do this. I'm acting towards your property. You know, I'm, I'm being oppressive here. I'm forcing you to, you want to go somewhere and I'm making you stop. I'm not allowing to, I'm oppressing you. You have money and I take it but through whatever, through an unfair tax. I'm oppressing you. Why? Because that money is yours, rightfully, morally yours. By overtaxing you, I'm doing something unethical, immoral. I'm oppressing you. Okay? By not allowing you to walk out when you want to walk out, you're a free person, why shouldn't you walk out? I'm oppressing you. I'm taking something that's yours away. In relation to God, the very question is actually, again, uh, meaningless. Because everything in existence is God's do dominion. There's no oppression of God towards his creatures. Oppression is when you own something, I'm sorry, when you don't own something and you do something with it that you don't have a right to do. If it's yours, if this is my cup of water, nobody says I'm oppressing the water by drinking it or I'm oppressing you by drinking the water. Why? Because this is in my, it's my property. I can do with it whatever I want. That's part of the whole point of private property and sales, right? If I transact, you know, I say, I'm going to sell you this book. And, and you say, okay, great, I wanted that book for a long time. I say, but on condition that, you keep, that I keep it and I get to read it. You say, well, what's the point of that sale then? It's no longer my property because the meaning of property is I can do with it what I want. If I want to lend it to you, I can, but you can't make a condition that it stays with... That's, that's an invalid, I mean, in, in contract law, that's an invalid sale. Now, take it at, at a higher level here. You can't speak about that in relation to God. Everything is God's. We are from God. Inna lillah. We are from Allah. Wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And to Him do we return. So there's no oppression. I've given you two levels now. Number one, at the very definition of oppression. And secondly, because of the, again, the concept of kasib, of acquisition that we said which entails our moral responsibility by our intention, by our 
wanting to do something. Yes, there's a question. So in, a, in a scenario where you, you intend to do something evil or something bad, but the action hasn't manifested itself yep. in the real world, yep. where does the culprit lie in that instance? Like well, you intend to do something well, but you know, by others, well, that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. That's the implication is be great, wake up and be grateful to God. He's given you a chance to reflect, right? And to not fall into doing those things. All right, so there's various, I mean, to be, to be more specific and more um, particular, there is some scholarly dispute. Does the person who intend, and there's various views on this, does the person who intends to do bad but doesn't do it, are they held liable for the action or not? There's, there's some who hold yes in the sense of not as much as somebody who actually executed, did it, but that God will hold them to account in some fashion or form for their bad intentions. There's others that hold that, no, if these things do not actually manifest, like you said, they don't actually do it, they wanted to, but the circumstances didn't allow to, them to, that they'll be forgiven for these things, that they'll be overlooked because they didn't actually act upon it. In, like I said, just being more precise, there is actually a debate amongst um, the scholars about this. But I guess in that, in that latter explanation, mm -hmm. isn't the implication then that if you, if you intend to do something mm -hmm. and it doesn't manifest itself, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, let's say 20 minutes, I mean, you're, you're held culpable, culpable for that, mm -hmm. but not for the, the other action where it hasn't manifested itself. So there's the intention and there's the actual deed. So in moral, legal terms, there are two separate things. Okay, in this world, as well as in, with God. This is the fundamental point. Which is why, again, there's traditions going back again, um, attributed to the Prophet wasalam, in which those who intend a good deed and, and do it, receive the reward for both. And those who intend a good deed, but aren't able to do it, still receive the reward of the intention. Okay, so again, it's here then where the, some of the onuma then towards the negative deed, that's an agreed upon point. Where they dif differ in their interpretation of this is what about when it's a bad deed? Okay, there's some things that seem to indicate that no a person is still morally culpable with God. Again, if they repent and they turn away, then it can be wiped out. But if they don't, if they die having intended to do it, then again, the, my understanding is the majority position here is that they're held liable for the intention which is different than the intention and the action. Do you see? In other words, an intention, in one sense, of course, is an action. Is it not? It's a, it's a moral, intellectual thing that arises from the heart. Okay? And yes, you can be held accountable for these things. Okay? Okay. So that answers... Um, that question, hopefully, or at least helps you think about it. And again, we're treating things in a very kind of basic format now. I don't want to get too scholastic about all of these, of these matters. Okay. Um, and this does link ultimately with what we're talking about even in the second class about uh, the spirituality of Islam, which is seeing that ultimately, you know, God is one in his being, as we talked about. He's not multiple. God is one in his attributes, meaning nobody shares his attributes, as we've talked about. And God is one in his actions. In other words, everything, is an, everything other than him is an action of God. Us, the carpet, the, whatever, and the things we do, our own actions, are actions of God. They're things that he brings into existence. Okay? So, you know, to... Yeah, let's just... For, for now, let's just leave it at that. So this is, this is all tied to this what we're ultimately at is at a spiritual level encouraged to witness in our lives, to witness Allah, to witness God in our lives. How? By means of what we're talking about here and the other things that we're talking about in, in the second class as well. So that one comes to see all things as being things created at that moment as they're happening by God, not of having the, the delusion that so-and-so did and so and so did and I did, no. Ultimately, God is the doer. He is the existentiator of these things. So this is a, a meshhad, a, a perspective of witnessing God in creation. Okay. Now, again, going on that earlier point, 
about the question about oppression, which we, dealt, we talked about very quickly. This entails what? It entails that God's, and again, this follows from the previous things that we've been talking about. God's rewarding obedient people, people who are obedient, I didn't really write that very well, is a matter of his grace. It's grace from God. And his punishment of the disobedient is justice. I mean, what is grace? What is fadl in Arabic? You know, grace is something that comes not out of force, but because someone wants it. If somebody is gracious towards you, it's not because you've got a gun to their head. It's not because you owe, they owe you something. It's because they simply want to do good by you. Not out of necessity. Not out of force. So this is the key point. Can God be forced to do anything? No. Including his rewarding of his servants. In other words, they're living in the, in the next world, in eternity, in his pleasure, in paradise, manifested in paradise. This is of his grace. Otherwise, again, we are the creatures of God and God does what he wills with his creatures. He's not forced to. He promises us and God doesn't break his promise. Okay? But this is from his grace that he promised paradise to those who do well. And his punishment of the disobedient is justice. Right? Somebody who denies God, who oppresses other creatures, who assumes, effectively, takes the role of God for themselves, determining unjustly who should live and who should die and who should be nuked and who shouldn't be nuked and who should be overtaxed and who shouldn't be undertaxed. And, and, right? They're playing a role that's beyond their role as a human being. They're acting as God. This is oppression. And it's of God's justice that these people in this world and in the next will face the consequences of their ill deeds. Again, unless one repents to God. And this is the meaning of a hadith that I'm sure many of you have heard before, uh, related from uh, Sayyidina Abu Huraira that heard the Messenger of Allah وسلم, say, no one enters paradise due to his actions. And those who were present said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah? And he replied, no, not even I, except that Allah envelops me in grace and mercy. And me and you, meaning he's saying. So strive and do your best. That should be your best. And let none of you wish for death. Okay, sometimes you hear religious people say, oh, I don't want to be in this world. This world is a dark place. It's not with God. It's, I, just, I wish I could die and go to the next world. The prophet's actually saying no. He's saying, so strive and do your best. And let none of you wish for death. For either he is one who does good, and perhaps he might increase in good, Okay. Or he is someone who does ill and perhaps he might change his ways. In other words, don't seek out death. If it comes, one, of course, accepts it. One doesn't run, you know, somebody says, you know, there's somebody, you, you jump to save somebody and you die in the process. You don't, be, you know, one doesn't run from the prospect of death. Death is inevitable. We're all going to die and so one has to accept and understand this. But at the same time, one doesn't wish for it, as he said. Either you're someone who's doing good, and so continue in that good and increase it. Or if someone's doing bad, well, you really don't want to die. You want time to repent and to change your ways. But the point that is of relevance to what we're talking about here is the first part. No one enters paradise to his, to his actions. Not even you, O messenger. He says, no, not even I. Except that God envelops us in his grace and his mercy. It's by means of this that paradise is entered. Which is what, as we said, it's the phenomenal world of the next life. Just like we have a the world that we experience phenomenally here, that is a manifestation of God's utter pleasure with those who enter it. Okay? So from this perspective, from this perspective, this is the true meaning of success, which is what? Which is having been shown this favor, this grace by God. Okay? in our actions in this world before the next. So now let's connect, in a sense, the next world where the ultimate results for eternity are manifest, the results of what we did in this world. What were we talking about at the first part of today's class? Our actions in this world and how we acquire them by our will, intending good or intending bad. So what is success and what is failure? Well, let's take a look at this verse of the Qur'an. 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ وَمَنْ يُرِدْ أَنْ يُضِلَّهُ يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ Whoever God desires to guide, so look at here in the Qur'an, God attributing the guidance to Himself, because guidance is an action. Being guided is something that happens, it occurs, it's a happening, right? He expands his breast to Islam. Here, meaning what? Islam here, meaning the submission to God, you know, in, its, in its lexical sense. Of course, there was people who were Muslims before Islam, capital I, previous, previous peoples. What we mean here is those who submit to God. And whomsoever he desires to lead astray, he makes that person's breast narrow, their heart narrow, as if he were climbing to heaven, as if it was something difficult. Okay, so what does this mean? This entails the way of understanding this. Because how does God say this in the Qur'an where elsewhere in the command? Again, He's commanding good and forbidding evil, which obviously means that you have a responsibility. Success, tawfiq, is Allah's creating both the ability and the inclination to do good, facilitating it. As we said, one should never get too full of oneself. Why? You know, we could be that person who's out on the streets, in a dark alley, drunk, if not for God's grace. I mean, don't think that one is above this. There's been many good people who ended their lives in a horrible state. And there have been many horrible people who ended their lives, right, in a very beautiful state. So what is success and what is failure? It's not about a particular thing. And we all know this, even anyone who's been alive for more than 10, 15, 20 years knows this. You wait to see the results of things. You don't deem something a success until you see the results. Right? I have a science experiment, I'm doing something, and it goes terribly wrong. And I say, oh, what a failure. And then by means of it going wrong, I discover something far, far more important. And this has happened in history, right? And then people say, wow, look how successful that person was. Now, in the short term, you thought, what a failure, because it didn't go according to plan. But by not going according to your plan, it actually ended up being something even more beneficial. So what am I, what's my point of saying this? And again, everyone knows this just in their interactions in life, their social interactions, right, their business interactions. Wait to see the results. What's the result? The result is what matters for eternity. So success, tawfiq, is Allah's creating both the ability, which we all right, have the ability to do if God so creates it, and facilitates the inclination, the goodwill. So again, a cause for us to be grateful to God. Going back to the hadith of the Prophet, right? No one enters paradise due to their own actions, rather by the grace of God. How does this grace of God manifest? By our will and the actions coinciding and our acquiring that morally good action then, okay? Which then manifests in eternity as God's pleasure. Do you see the connection between these things? Failure, khidlan, is the opposite of success. What is that? Like we just saw in the verse of the Qur'an. Whomsoever he desires to lead astray, he makes his breast narrow, tight. So Allah is creating both the ability and the inclination to evil. So this is why a person, you know, at a more spiritual level, we're taught always to be on the lookout. You do a good action and it gets to your head. So you do more of those good actions, but all of a sudden now that good action is tainted. And it could be that your ego is getting bigger and bigger and bigger by means of what, nominally speaking, are good actions. In fact, you're being led astray. You're being led astray. You're being allowed to be led astray. It's a little bit like an adult with a child who they want the child to learn on their own. Right? So the child makes some mistakes and you, the adult, the parent doesn't say anything. They could. They could intervene right then and there, but they don't. Why? For the person, the child to learn. Okay? So ability here includes the means and the instruments by means of which these things are done. Okay? Uh, we won't get into that for now. The point being, 
this is the ultimate, and the ultimate success and failure is that which is for eternity. That which leads to felicity, true happiness, sa'adat, that, that, that quality that all philosophers and all religions ultimately seek after. Okay, felicity, happiness, or misery. So true felicity is that one's life end upon Islam. One could spend, as we said, your whole life in evil, in someone doing evil, but if they repent, even if it's an hour before they die, not knowing they're going to die, turn back to God, submit to Allah, accept what He wants us to accept, acknowledge what He wants us to acknowledge. There were people who accepted the Prophet and died without having performed a single prayer. There was a person who came from a tribe to Medina, accepted Islam at the hand of the Prophet, asked his permission of the Prophet to go back to his pro tribe, in order to teach them what he had just learned, to inform them, and died on the way. Never having performed a single prayer. But the person died knowing, loving God. Now, could their love perhaps have somebody else's love taken longer to grow, to mature? This is a different answer. Our life is a spiritual journey, of course. But my point being what? This is true felicity because this entails eternity afterwards. All of that person's bad actions before erased, negated. And now they're held accountable for what they did from then onwards. Okay? True misery, true unhappiness is that which is again eternal. That one's life end in a denial of Islam, a denial of submission of God, a denial of an ingratitude towards Allah Most High. Okay? And, as we said, God's knowledge, we talked about His attribute of knowledge a few weeks ago. Yes, it's complete, it's not limited. So Allah knows, before we know, because God is not in time, we're in time, who's, felic who's going to be felicitous, who's going to be happy, and who's going to be miserable. Not happy and miserable in any given moment just of our lives, because we all go through happiness and misery. But ultimately, in eternity. Okay, and this is the purpose of re this is the purpose of the deen. To channel us towards that which is ultimately in our own well-being, our own good. Okay. And so on this, we'll end on this last hadith, where Bukhari and Muslim relate on the authority of Sahil ibn Sa'id uh, Sa that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi said, "Verily, a person performs an action of the people of paradise." as far as is apparent to other people. In other words, it looks like the person is a person of paradise, but he's of the people of hellfire. Were there not munafiqun? Were there not people who were two-faced around the Prophet? They seem to do good. And another person performs an action of the people of the hellfire, as far as is apparent to people, but is actually of the people of paradise. What matters? What matters is one's end, how one ends. That's what matters. Now, this does not mean bank on it. <laughs> it doesn't mean go ahead and, you know, run amok and then say, yeah, well, when I'm 70, I'm going to start then, because then, usually people die when they're about 80 or 90 or 100 or something. So at the age of 70, just be on the safe side. I won't wait till I'm 80. I'll start when I'm 70. I'll start doing good actions, because what matters is how I end. Well, no one guaranteed you're going to get there. What we mean is, when your end comes, how were you then? How were you then? Okay? And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate uh, this good ending for us, inshallah ta'ala. I hope, again, at least as a basic mental mapping, like I said, I'm not worried whether everyone in the room can define acquisition. And this isn't, we're not here to do scholastic theology. We're not here. It's not, there's no exam on this from me. The point is just to at least have a mental map of how these things connect together. How God being the creator of things, including our actions, how our moral responsibility and how this manifests in the akhirah as paradise or hell, how these things are connected. And what it means when the Prophet ﷺ says, none of you enters by your actions. Well, why say that if we're commanded to do good actions? And the Quran itself says, those who did good actions enter paradise. This is how it's connected. Is, this, is there any questions about this before we enter? There's one last question I want to address, which we'll do next week, inshallah ta'ala, related to the attributes, and then before we go into the section about the Prophets and Prophet Muhammad and his attributes. 
which is the question of, again, the existence of evil, why it exists. Not just that it exists, which is what we talked about today, but why? A question that many people have and somebody, I think, raised in this question. So hopefully next week we'll touch upon that question, inshallah ta'ala. Sallallahu wa barakatuh, Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. We'll take just a, a brief break.